So our business in wireless grew by around 15% in 2016. We did benefit from a tailwind of Forex of about 10% following the, the vote to Brexit. Um, but we also managed to post, uh, as a result of that, a 5% uh, uh, constant currency increase. So that was principally driven by uh, adoption of gallium nitride and sil on silicon carbide for base station applications. Uh, in general, our wireless business has been relatively flat over the last uh, three or four years. And that's because most of our wireless business is for power amplifiers, which are going to mobile handsets. Uh, they're used in communicating with the outside world to Wi-Fi hotspots, to base stations, to, to satellites. And there's two headwinds we've faced there. The first one is that the amount of uh, handset sales has been relatively flat over the last three years or so. And that's because there's been a lack, generally a lack of uh, uh, presumed, presumed innovation in handsets. Uh, so that's been uh, a bit of a, a bit of a headwind. The second one is that uh, power amplifiers are shrinking in, in terms of size, and so companies have found ways of making more and more chips for a given given wafer size. Uh, so even though the content of power amplifiers and mobile phones has been increasing, the number of wafers required has remained relatively flat. Moving forward, though, we see some pretty uh, exciting opportunities for accelerating growth in wireless. The first is that we are taking more and more market share as a result of IQE's scale and of our product range. So we've already taken some meaningful share in 2016 from some of our competitors. The second one is that we believe, and there's lots of press speculation at the moment, about a new wave of innovation in handsets. Particularly, there's been a lot of excitement about 3D sensing being incorporated into advanced handsets in the next, uh, the next generation or two. So big advantage for us there is that not only do we think it will increase the number of handset sales and hence benefit our wireless content, but it will also increase the amount of compound semiconductor content in a handset because the types of device which will be used in these 3D sensing applications are called vertical cavity lasers or VIXELs. And I can say a little bit more about that uh, in, a, in a short while. Uh, the third element which we think will help accelerate our wireless sales is the adoption of increased adoption of gallium nitride uh, on both a silicon carbide substrate, that's a very high power and expensive solution to base stations and military applications, um, but there's a material called gallium nitride on silicon, which is a very low cost solution, uh, which has the benefits and performance benefits of compound semiconductors closer to a, point, a price point of silicon. And uh, we, are, we have a very strong relationship with a US company called Macom, they're launching uh, gallium nitride on silicon for base station, base station applications, but also they are uh, looking at very many consumer applications for RF, such as microwave ovens, uh, RF, RF charging on, on mobile handsets, uh, all sorts of other consumer applications, which are enabled by the lower price point of gallium nitride on silicon. Um, and then the fourth element is a little bit further out, but 5G communications will clearly use increasing amounts of compound semiconductors. And I think we're very well positioned to address that market. And we are seeing some, a number of development programs already being established to, to address that market. So I think in the future, our wireless business is likely to accelerate in terms of growth, uh, as opposed to being flat as it has been for the last two or three years. So Fedonis has been uh, growing pretty rapidly for the last uh, three years. Uh, and it's been driven by two principal dynamics. One is a material called indium phosphide, which is used particularly in fiber optic communication systems. And the second one is a materials uh, device system called vertical cavity lasers, uh, of which we're uh, global leaders in terms of the supply of. Indium phosphide is used as, as a fundamental material in fiber optic communications. So in a fiber optic communication system, you essentially have a thin strand of glass fiber, and at either end, you have an indium phosphide transmitter, which transmits laser light. And at the other end, you have a detector, which detects that light and converts it back to an electrical signal. So every fiber optic system in the world has indium phosphide uh, transmitters and receivers. Um, as you know, the growth of data uh, for its transmission and its storage and retrieval has been growing exponentially. And so fiber optic systems have been growing pretty rapidly as well, both in terms of the quantum but also in terms of the speed of the system, the speed the system needs to operate at. So fiber optics are now being used throughout the entire internet infrastructure, from connecting base stations together, to fiber to the premises, to the inside of data centers, to everything in between. 
And there's some very nice, powerful dynamics which are happening, uh, which are spurring the growth of indium phosphide. Uh, one, for example, is the data centers are internally being completely optical fibered, and the, there is an upgrade cycle every two and a half or three years to increase the speed of the devices to the next generation. So today might be 10 gigabits, next generation might be 25 gigabits, next generation might be 100 gigabits. And so there's a, a natural replacement cycle happening there. In terms of IQE's position in that marketplace, one of the absolutely critical devices is called a DFB laser, distributed feedback laser. Uh, and this allows a very precise light uh, wavelength to be emitted, enabling fiber optic systems to have higher capacity by uh, multiplexing many of these wavelengths together. Uh, in the past, IQE supplied what have been called base wafers for this particular application, and our customers take these base wafers and put corrugations or gratings on the surface of the wafers and then put further epitaxy on, on the surface of that. Um, what IQE has been able to do over the last couple of years is develop uh, an in-house technology called nano-imprint lithography, which allows us to make these uh, uh, sub-micron sub gratings internally. And then we've also developed the technology for putting the additional epitaxy on top. And so we're able to offer now a, what we call a full-service wafer. And the value of a, a full-service wafer is significantly higher than the value of a base wafer. And so we see our sales and indium phosphide devices increasing as a result of that. Okay, so we've been working on Vixels for actually the best part of 20 years, so we've had a long, long history in the development of Vixels. Uh, I think it's fair to say we're global leaders in that space. Uh, we're in mass production at 4-inch. We've introduced, we're the first company to introduce a 6-inch wafer product. Uh, we hold the world record for the speed of operations of Vixels and also the lowest power consumption for Vixels. So, uh, I think we have broadly a very powerful position in the marketplace. We estimate in terms of outsourcing that we have something like an 80% market share. So there's a number of very big potential drivers for Vixel applications in the future. T today, Vixels are used in, in data center applications for short distance fiber optic communications. Uh, they're used in the last uh, smartphone generation had something called laser autofocus uh, in, in, introduced into it. And what this involves is uh, a Vixel being used to emit pulses of light to the object, and the phone measures the speed it takes for, or, or the time it takes for the signal to go from the phone to the object and back again, and from the time it takes, it can easily calculate the distance because you know what the speed of light is. Um, that uh, allows very rapid autofocusing, and also under a completely uh, a complete range of ambient conditions because it's obviously using its own light source. So whenever you take a picture on a mobile handset or, or any other camera for that matter, typically you get a 2D image of a 3D environment. So what 3, 3D sensing is about is about using that same kind of principle that I just described for autofocus, but illuminating a scene with a whole array of laser beams and getting the depth information in the image capture. So that's 3D sensing, and depending on what kind of resolution is required, then could be 100 pixels or 1,000 pixels or, or whatever the number is for that array. But whatever it is, it's an increased area of, of pixel uh, wafer that is required for that application. Now, there's lots of speculation that these will be introduced into the next uh, uh, launches of smartphones um, around the world, and that would clearly in in increase the uh, content uh, of Vixels in, uh, in that application. Uh, there's two other very big applications uh, for Vixels. One is something called LIDAR. Uh, it stands for Light Detection and Radar, so it's the, the light equivalent of radar, uh, and that's, uh, that will be used in autonomous drive ve vehicles uh, in particular, so a big application there. And the other application is for industrial heating. Uh, where you can use essentially digi digital heating, you can, uh, these things can switch on and off very quickly. Uh, you use the infrared capability to, to very uh, specifically target an area that you want to heat and you can turn that heat source on and off very rapidly. So again, these will use very significant arrays of, of Vixel devices to, uh, to create that energy and that, that heating content. So uh, all in all, there's a very bright future ahead, we think, for Vixel technology.